Uh, Ronald Pope, uh, U.S. Army retired, uh, 20 years. Uh, starting off with uh, public affairs as a radio TV announcer and studio technician. Uh, PsyOps was my beginning in special warfare uh, before I went through the Q course and uh, then went through the Q course. And uh, from then on out, everything was as it worked out. Uh, went with various special forces groups to include the 5th in Vietnam. Came back to the States. Um, they were downsizing special forces, and I figured that uh, better that they send me to some place that I knew I probably wouldn't fit in. I went into the intelligence field and uh, finished up my career in Army counterintelligence. Thank you. And can I ask what year you joined and what year you left? I joined in December of 63 and retired at the end of January 84. Thank you. And uh, if we dial it back to your early life, uh, where did you grow up? I grew up primarily in uh, Westchester County, New York, family out of Virginia originally. And I uh, always wanted to live in California. So I uh, moved to California in my early 20s. I had some relatives, relatives living there and uh, stayed there a couple of years and waited too long to go back to school and lost my deferment and found myself being drafted into the Army. So what year were you drafted then? That would have been 63. 63. Mm. And, and you would have heard the Kennedy speech about Special Forces. Yes, yes. Uh, matter of fact, I, when he was assassinated, I was at the Navy recruiting office in San Francisco trying to beat the draft, which unfortunately I couldn't. I couldn't get all my paperwork together in time enough to go into the program I wanted to go into. So um, next thing I knew, I found me at myself at uh, Fort Ord, California. Why, why were you aiming for the Navy? Uh, the Nuclear Submarine Service. I had just enough schooling to qualify for the program. And, and was that something related to family or anything? Uh, yes, most of my relatives that had spent their career in the military were Navy. Uh, uh, both sides of my family were basically from the Tidewater area of Virginia, uh, where they have their largest naval base. Right, so what happened when, once you got to Fort Ord? Um, it was, to me, it was sort of routine. I mean, I, I saw nothing particularly hard about it. Um, the uh, only thing I didn't like was uh, hand-to-hand -hand combat because either my feet were too heavy or my head was too heavy. And every time they tried to have me do a flip, I would land head down rather than flat on my back. And that was even after being a wrestler in high school. So that part was uncomfortable. But outside of that, um, it wasn't too bad, a little bit on the chilly side because it was wintertime for California and uh, that section of California never really warms up that much. Matter of fact, I think it was one of the few places where you could wear your winter greens year round because uh, it just didn't warm up that much there. And, and how long were you there? I was there for a little over three months. Uh, I was a holdover from basic training, uh, waiting for whatever they were going to have me to do. And it turned out they were looking for someone uh, who has sufficient experience 
and the radio television business to uh, take a direct assignment. And uh, they had just had uh, the riots in Panama uh, uh, there, and they needed to bring all the units up to strength there. So I found myself on an aircraft uh, going to uh, the uh, canal zone and being assigned to the uh, Armed Forces Radio and Television Station there at Fort Clayton Canal Zone. What, what, what kind of things happened while you were down there? Um, by the time I arrived, the riots had been quelled, and so it was learning the business in accordance with the way the military did, and I wound up working the television side of the house more so than the radio side of the house as a staff announcer and cameraman. And I became the chief cameraman and studio technician for making sure the lights in the studio were set up properly for the live programming. And um, in those days, we were still using film rather than videotapes. So when we were finished with our live programming, I was sitting in the studio and being eyes on the monitor in case one of the films broke or the film chain went down uh, so I could run into the control room and assist if needed and uh, until it was time for the station to go off air for the night and then clean up, go to town or stay in just you know depending on the time of the month and um, what was taking place at the time. It, it sounds like quite a, a fun uh, post to, to have had uh, to be in a nice warm country like Panama and as a young man and go ashore and spend some of your pay. And, I mean, was it, is that how you saw it? Uh, yes. Uh, the, um, the one thing I'll never forget uh, because uh, I guess about six months after I arrived there I made private first class, and I'll never forget the money I made at that time, which was $99.36 a month. And when I reported in, I was, ex I thought it was a safe pay type. You drafted in, you get paid what you were paid when you were a civilian. That was a shock. <laughs> no place near what I was making as a civilian. So I had, that was a hard adjustment to make. But I made it and uh, discovered that uh, being in the Army wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be and re-enlisted, collected my bonus, and then looked around to see what could I do to further advance myself in the military outside of the radio and television business. That wasn't mainstream. Well, as they call it, the pipeline. So that's when I started looking around. and There was a special forces unit there. At that time, they had a program called Buddy Swap. And if someone wanted to go to a certain location or go to a certain career field for whatever reason, uh, and there was someone who could reciprocate, to replace him at, at uh, or her at the current duty station, then if both commanders agreed, then you made a transfer. And it just so happened there was an individual who was a real professional uh, uh, radio announcer, and he wanted to bring his skills back up as he was about to get out, and he was with the uh, PSYOPs detachment augmenting the special forces group there and uh, I said it's just like a good swap to me and both commanders agreed and I was supposed to receive my uh, jump wings and my uh, special forces qualification while I was there and uh, 
doing the IG inspection, they said, no, you, you know, not authorized to do that. You know, anybody that you have here that is not fully qualified, then you'll have, they'll have to go back to Fort Bragg and Fort Benning uh, rather than, you know, we'll let you slide on the ones you've done that for so far. Uh, but consider that an unauthorized program. So, though we found ourselves wearing berets, but no flash, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I was satisfied with that. And then uh, the Army decided that it need to build up its cadre uh, at the various training posts uh, for draftees and enlistees uh, going to Vietnam, and I found myself on a levee to Fort, back to Fort Ord, California, where I went to the uh, uh, public affairs office, did hometown news releases, and sort of uh, post uh, mimeograph for the, instead of having a newspaper, we had a mimeograph from I would go into the office early, uh, pull the tapes off of the teletype machine from, I forget who it was, either AP or UPI at the time, and uh, then do the type up for the uh, newsletter, take it in, get it uh, mimeographed, and then I would distribute it throughout the various training units, go back in, start doing my hometown news releases of whatever else had to be done in the office there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then formally, while I was there, applied for the Special Forces training. Right, I mean, that sounds like a really big jump from doing newsletters and TV stuff to, to go through Special Forces. So, so you must have been um, fit and strong and feeling up for it, I guess? Well, um, growing up in New York, I was kind of brash, uh, always an adventurer, and I had traveled as a kid, so, uh, and I figured if you're going to do anything, go with the best that you can find, and as far as I knew, if I've I was going to do something special, go with what was considered elite, and if I, you know, fit the program, then go from there. So I was able to pass all the uh, written tests, the interview, uh, my uh, uh, section commander, who was uh, the public affairs officer, I should say, who was an infantry officer. I think he was airborne also. I said, hey, I'm glad to have someone, you know, who wants to go that, and he recommended me. And so after about four months of being there, I found my way to, um, on my way to Fort Benning uh, for the airborne school, and then to Fort Bragg for the Q course. What, what was it like getting off the bus at Benning? Um, It, it's hard to say. Uh, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I expected to be shouted at and yelled at, you know, right from the moment one. Um, but signing in was more or less a kind of a quiet affair. And the shouting and the yelling didn't begin until they had the class assembled. And you're going to double time every place you go, otherwise you're going to be dropped. And uh, I said, and I was semi-athletic, uh, having wrestled and ran track, and I rode bicycles before uh, racing bike, not uh, not full race, but touring bikes, before I went into the army. So I, I wasn't in too bad a condition, and again, is the physical part of it, you know, really wasn't anything that was that arduous and, uh, and just followed instructions. 
And I, I found out that as long as I did that and self-correct when I was told to self-correct, you know, there was nothing to be bothered about. Thanks. And getting to the jump side of things, um, did you have any sort of reservations or fear of heights? Or I mean, how was that? No. Um, I'm the type that if you say you can, you want to do something or you can do it or, or whatever, then you just keep your eyes ahead and you just go ahead and do it. Uh, you don't back down once you volunteer to do something. Uh, get kicked out, but don't drop out. So I just followed instructions. Uh, made it through my ground week and my tower week and hitched a ride with one of my classmates up to Fort Bragg and started the Q course. And the same thing there is uh, if I'm going to volunteer, don't drop out, get kicked out. And I just, if I had to self-correct, I would self-correct. So I found it to be I'm not saying it was easy, I'm just, it was routine and you just followed instructions. So what year were you at Bragg? Was that like 65 by then? Uh, I got to Bragg in August of 66. Yes, got so to Bragg in August of 66 and completed the Q course in February of 67. And uh, was assigned to the signal. My basic was uh, communications. So I was assigned to uh, the signal company in the sixth group. And then they had a call for volunteers to go to Thailand. I signed up for that. Uh, always wanted to, you know, go travel. Matter of fact, before I was drafted with my with things not going exactly the way I expected them to go uh, in uh, California, uh, my relative that I was living with had been a merchant seaman uh, before he was drafted in World War II. So I was was going to get assistance from him to find out, you know, here's what I'm going to do. I'll be at sea, I'd save money after much faster than what I'm doing now and um, then get back in school once, you know, done a few floats and so forth and see what shore duty is like and, you know, be a typical merchant seaman. So, so you got to Thailand. Um, what, and what, what was it like arriving there? It was fine. I uh, did the uh, base station you know, communications and then my last four months in country, I was, I became the uh, advisor to a medical civic action program that uh, we had, uh, which took place uh, going out to villages and small towns along the rivers and canals there in Thailand, which was really good uh, because I really lived as the locals lived. Uh, no American food, you know, all Thai food, Thai water out of the rivers and so forth, which kind of many pop mocked my face from uh, uh, bathing in the canals with contaminated water. Uh, you know, working with the medic, you know, I was able to take care of it. So instead of having large pop marks, I wound up, and it's decreased over the years where it's barely noticeable. And uh, that's when I learned, really learned the diplomatic side of being in special forces because you're going to villages, and most of them had never seen a foreigner before. And they, you know, want to know what is it like being an American? Uh, where are you from in America? What did you do there? And, and so you're sitting down and you're talking with people and perhaps the most significant part of that project when I was on it was um, 
on our return back to our uh, command base, uh, we told this one village we would stop back by uh, on our way back down river. And all the senior men of the village came out and it was like having a powwow there on the stern of the uh, barge. And it turned out the eldest member of the village that was in attendance had uh, worked in the same part of Thailand that my counterpart's father had worked in during World War II against the Japanese. So it, it, it turned out to be one of the most memorable evenings I had. Uh, and then we were drinking the local homemade whiskey also, <laughs> which is quite similar to our uh, white lightning here. So that's, I mean, that's the epitome of the Green Beret. Yes. In terms of the, the, you know, working with the indigenous people and winning over hearts and minds. And was, was there any element to your outreach work there that was about uh, countering communism? Um, no, it was very minor in a way because uh, in Thailand at that time, there were two different insurgencies. There was an overlap with the Malay insurgency down south on the thai Malay border. And then there was an overlap from the uh, Pathet Lao and how much in conjunction the two work up north. Um, and which the people assigned to the A-teams going up that way had uh, more contact with. Uh, on one of our trips, I was supposed to go up toward the Golden Triangle. Uh, and we didn't realize that the dam that they had built across the, was it the Shanghai River? Anyway, which, whichever river it was that went up to Chiang Mai had slowed the water flow enough sufficiently that it caused silting of the river and we couldn't get past Tok Lee without running aground seemed like every hundred feet we went. And to jump in net deep water to try to dislodge a seven ton barge is not fun. So we decided we would turn around and instead of going up that river, we went up the Nine River again and stopped at villages we hadn't stopped at before. That's when I learned you could fish with a hand crank generator and uh, get these little river anchovies or whatever they were called to jump up into a net and then you give them to the cook and fry them up or whatever for dinner or lunch. It's that kind of augmenting rations with fresh food. Is that the idea? Well, we had fresh food. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a budget and uh, we bought our own food. We had a bus both a budget for food and then we had a budget for uh, pharmaceuticals and, and, and medicines, mm -hmm. uh, which the uh, two medics on board were the uh, were responsible for doing. My job primarily was make sure we have communications back to home base and also to just kind of keep an oversight of how the money was spent and that it uh, wasn't being misappropriated so forth. So how long did that sort of those expeditions in Thailand last? Um, on working on the boat, we went out for a month at a time and uh, we would resupply ourselves, you know, along the way uh, at local markets and so forth. And we see a village that looked good and say, okay, we'll tie up here, talk with the village chief. And if he wants us to stay there, uh, then we'll stay there, hold sick call the next morning, and uh, whoever wants to be treated. And we always have customers. The um, um, it, it was a way of 
letting locals know that their national government had an interest in them. And matter of fact, we arrived in one village at just the right time. Uh, somebody from wherever driving his Mercedes along the country road uh, was driving too fast and uh, hit a grandmother and uh, their grandchild. Uh, and so we were able to give them medical assistance until they could get a boat passing by to stop to take them down to the province uh, hospital. Mm. So that was helpful. And, uh, and in one village, I uh, ran across a Peace Corps worker who had not had the chance to speak English for a couple of months or so. So he bent my ear all night while we did our propaganda thing, uh, showing movies and so forth, and uh, which was fun. I, I could understand uh, uh, how he felt. Although I, I, I wasn't in the same situation he was, but I could understand being isolated, you know, for a while and more or less going native. So in, this is 66. Uh, what, what sort of weapons? Oh, 67, that this was. This 67, sorry. Yes. So what sort of weapons were you carrying at this point? Uh, M16s, and because of the communications equipment that I had on the Civic Action Program, uh, I had a sidearm and a shotgun uh, because in Thailand at that time, uh, we really weren't supposed to openly be carrying weapons. Uh, the, the Thais wanted all weaponry to be under their control, uh, but under certain conditions, if you were carrying certain communications equipment and so forth, then you were allowed to be armed. So. For that, I, I, I had I was allowed to have uh, firearms. Did you have any uh, like Royal Thai Army guys with you? Or anything? Yes, my my counterpart was uh, uh, and his assistant were from the special forces, their special forces unit, and then the boat crew were, were Thai Army also. And did you ever get into any kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, contact or anything during the time in Thailand, or was it all peaceful? It was all peaceful. Uh, we did turn in one contact report, at least my counterpart did, uh, in one of the villages. Uh, one individual over questioned him. He didn't question me, but he did question my counterpart. So when he got back, uh, he let me know that he was turning in a contact report. And, and for the most part, uh, it was, uh, it was, there were two things that I exposed to the, them to was first off being a foreigner and then being a black foreigner. Uh, as we were pulling to a village, the kids would run along the banks, you know, for home, for home. And they look, take a second, then they'd run home and get their parents. <laughs> Come back to where we tied the uh, barge up, and because uh, it was funny, uh, we would stop just before dinner time, and the cook would fix up the food, and we're sitting on the stern of the boat eating, and we say, "Oh yes, he eats just like we do, <laughs> and he's eating our food also." So it it was a psychological operation and a show at the same time, which. Uh, you could derive fun, fun from, and uh, it, 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 like I said, it was l letting the people know that their national government, you know, was trying to look out for them, and uh, we ran across no hostilities. I mean, there was one time, we didn't do any uh, work there, but we had to stop overnight, and the only place we could uh, tie off the barge was at a commercial wharf, and... Uh, because uh, it was the main river route, and the owner of the uh, wharf didn't, you know, didn't want us there at, at his wharf tied off. So, yeah, fine, no problem. And 
as soon as possible. Um, everybody was up, unroped in the barge and continued on upriver. So what, how did this sort of uh, pan out? You know, um, I assume at some point you're going to Vietnam. So, so where, how did you get to Vietnam from here? Um, when I could not receive authorization for an extension. And so uh, when I, I was supposed to be going to Fort Bragg, and I didn't particularly want to go to Fort Bragg I wanted to stay overseas. I was single at the time. Uh, I wanted to stay overseas as much as possible, obtain uh, as much experience as possible. So at that time, uh, Ms. Myers had not retired. She was the uh, chief assignment person at the Pentagon for uh, Special Forces. So on my way from the West Coast to the East Coast, I stopped at the Pentagon and went to her office and said, uh, I don't want to go to Fort Bragg. And she said, that's the only place I have to send you. I said, you can't send me to Germany or Okinawa or back down to Panama. So I opened my big mouth and said, well, what about Vietnam? Yeah, yeah, I can send you there. I said, okay. Just send me there. She says, okay, just give me your address of where you're going to be. And I gave her my address, and about a month and a half later, I received my uh, orders to report to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, to get basically equipped out to go to Vietnam, to the uh, 5th Special Forces Group. Did you do any kind of preparatory training before going to Vietnam? Uh, no, I, the preparatory training I did was uh, before I went to Thailand. And that was a three month course and that's where I received my cross training and uh, briefings from uh, other federal agencies that like the State Department and uh, USAID and the other services uh, on uh, liaison between all the agencies involved um, and uh, depending on where you were going, uh, you know, what kind of support, you know, that they provided for that particular area and so forth. So it was about a three month long course and I re also received my first foreign language training and uh, once that was completed, um, there was a plane load of us uh, that uh, went to uh, was it Oakland Army Terminal uh, for receiving whatever final paperwork we needed. And then they had a charter aircraft from uh, San Francisco to uh, Bangkok. And... Um, from Bangkok, we were bussed up to our C team headquarters. And then once there, they told, told us, you know, we want you to go there, we want you to go there, and so forth. What was the cross training like? It was good. Um, there were only two weapons I didn't fully master, and that was because the sights were different. That was uh, the mortar and uh, the. Uh, Recordless rifle. Uh, for the mortar later on, I learned out how, I said, well, let me just get a big sheet of graph paper and plot the graph paper and, and overlay that on the map. And if they tell me they, you know, they want, but that the weapons people had this thing of hey fiddle diddle or something like that and, and, and getting the sights lined up with the aim pulse and then whatever the fire mission was, was, uh, uh, you know, whether to go left, right, tra Travis, or elevate or uh, depress. And so I said, I'm going to figure out a good shortcut here. And I got myself, I was able to find myself a 
big role of uh, of, uh, of um, graph paper and overlay it on the map. And so if, if I had to fill in for someone on the mortar, uh, I could put my graph paper down and look and then coordinate the graph paper to the grid scale, uh, uh, squares on the map. And then say, so, okay, if they tell me to go this, I know where to uh, elevate or traverse the mortar to, which I never had to do. Um, and take it from there and then, you know, uh, adjust from there. So the mortar and, and the Rakolis rifle were the, uh, the two weapons I never really fully mastered, and I never had to use either one. Did you get um, a chance during the weapons stage uh, of um, using Soviet weapons? Yes. I, as I did on one job application years later, I fired basically every European and American weapon from World War, well, actually not everyone from World War I, but from World War II through Vietnam uh, doing my cross training. So not master, but proficient enough that uh, if I had to use uh, a weapon outside of the M14 or a BAR, of what are, you know, as far as, far as uh, light to medium weapons, uh, I was familiar enough with it that I had no problems as far as maintaining it, stripping it, and so forth, and was comfortable enough with it. And, and was there medical and demo aspects to the cross training as well? Uh, yes, medical also, although. Uh, it wasn't until I arrived in Vietnam that uh, I went a little bit more deeper into, I, I call it being a combat medic as against a school trained medic because uh, there are not a sufficient number of medics to go around uh, all teams that went on a mission. So someone had to be able to uh, give transfusions, set bones, uh, give needles, dispense with pre actual prescription drugs. It was generally either the team leader or the assistant team leader. And uh, as a team leader, then I kept myself responsible for all the medications. And did you get to blow things up as well? Uh, yes, never had to do it in, uh, under a firefight, but uh, yes, between gunfire and uh, explosives and then some electronic stuff afterwards, um, I now have constant tinnitus in both ears and looking forward to getting a hearing aid uh, yes, for this ear over here. So you've done your cross training uh, before Thailand, you've been to Thailand, you've come back and you've gone to Washington to get and volunteered for Vietnam. Um, and can you Take us from there. So, so did you get uh, you got to leave before you uh, deployed to Vietnam? Yes, I, like I said, after I left DC, I was before they finally got orders out to me. I was home for about a month and a half. So I was home for Thanksgiving. Didn't quite make it to Christmas. And uh, uh, matter of fact, I think I arrived arrived at my FOB. maybe a week before Christmas, someplace in there. It was right after uh, one of my colleagues, you know, I, I hadn't met everyone, I didn't know him then. Uh, he had just, matter of fact, I was there when he, uh, 
released himself from the hospital, took a taxi from Pleiku to Kantum. Uh, he had gone on a rescue mission uh, in which they had to pull a team out and he received the Medal of Honor. That was Bob Howard. So, uh, good army guy. Um, probably can't speak enough of him. I mean, he was straightforward. Um, he knew what he was supposed to do, when he was supposed to. Matter of fact, for a short while, he was our recon company com uh, first sergeant uh, before uh, uh, another person came in and, uh, who's it, uh, Downey came in and took over, uh, I think, uh, Choo Choo Penn took over from Howard and Downey took over from Choo Choo Penn and it became the recon company. And plus he had his own team also. If we just dial it back a little bit, before you went to Vietnam, you must have been watching the news at home with your family and seeing what was happening because because of the broadcast, you know, the nightly broadcasts of Vietnam appearing on the news? Uh, yes. Uh, matter of fact, um, it was when I was in v uh, Panama that I started paying attention because they started the build up then. And uh, the radio station, radio TV station, it was right across the main highway and a patch of jungle from the Miraflores Locks there on the Pacific end of the canal. So we could see the transports starting to build up to take equipment and, and so forth. And I think a troop ship might have gone through with the 101st while I was still in uh, Panama. Uh, and so that was the beginning. That was in 65. And so when I was at home on leave, uh, my mother wasn't all that happy with me going to Vietnam. Uh, matter of fact, she didn't even want me to hold a weapon in my hand, um, which everybody thought was kind of funny. But you know, just hey, that's that's my assignment. You know, I didn't. I I don't know if I told them that I had volunteered or not. But the funny part about that, my I became engaged while I was home on leave, and uh, my wife was at uh, grad school at the time, and as part of industrial safety, uh, whatever it anyway, she had, she had a class where a part of it was, uh, I would say industrial safety. And it turned out we went to the uh, Winchester ammunition plant. And they were one of the major suppliers of 7.62 ammunition. And I sort of took over that portion once we were down on the production floor. I said, oh, yeah. I said, matter of fact, uh, I'll probably be using some of this stuff in a couple of months. And then the professor looked at me, and he let me talk. And I gave a basic talk on what the 7.62 uh, ammunition was used for. And uh, realized I was talking too much shit up my mouth and let the professor say what he, he wanted to say. But uh, I think that he was kind of surprised that he had someone that he didn't know whether I was in the car. All he knew was this, this person with the class and uh, uh, knew what the ammunition was all about, the ballistics of it, and so forth. So it was kind of. Uh, uh, I don't want to say enlightening, but eye-opening for my wife's classmate and, uh, and and the professor. So, what what was your expected uh, tour duration when you were going to go over? 
a year. Yeah. But I had, since I was still single, I was going to stay for the duration uh, until I went on extension leave and my wife and I married on my extension leave. My wife said, uh, no, come on, why don't you, you know, come home? Uh, I guess with most civilians, they look at a war, I mean, it's not a peaceful place. It can be dangerous, but not everyone becomes wounded or killed. Or so. The majority of the people come back home, but most people don't think in those terms. They, they think, you know, everyone is a casualty. You know, it turned out that we did have that amount of casualties in the unit I was in, but you know, in the broad spectrum of things, most people come back home un unscathed. So, okay, so, um, so you've gone over to Vietnam, and, and how did it feel? So, I guess you flew in on a on a um, commercial jet. Uh yes, on a char on a charter. Uh, matter of fact, it was uh, Braniff Airlines. I remember that. Good-looking flight attendants. And where did you land? I uh, landed at uh, the Air Force Base in uh, Saigon. Uh, Thompson Nut. Mm. And then from there, I was <clears throat> assigned to a flight going up to Netrang to group headquarters. Had you heard about SOG or C Command and Control or anything like that? Yes. It was all rumor. You watch, if you heard heard about it, you didn't say anything. Nobody knew what any anybody did there. All they knew was, hey, if you wanted to be scared out of your life and shot up, that's where you went. And I think most people didn't realize that SOG and C and C were interrelated. And they knew this over here we got C and C and which was command and control, and over here we got SOC. And uh, when I arrived at, uh, or got my assignment uh, while at that train, that's when I found out that they were both, uh, not one and the same, but one was a tasking element and one was an operational element. And, and so had you, had you got orders for SOG? Or did you volunteer for SOG during in processing? Uh, I thought since I was going to stay with for the duration, I would build up my experience, starting with trying to be on an A team, and then the under USARV uh, was uh, which the Fifth Special Forces Group fell under. They had Project Delta, and I said. So when I filled out my in-country gene, you know, I put down A-Team, Delta, and then I put down C and C. And uh, they were still building up, even though it was December, they were still building up from uh, the Tet Offensive uh, earlier in 68. So there were two other people that I reported in country with, uh, Yamira and uh, Plaster. And uh, we all three wound up straight assignment to CNC. Found ourselves on the airplane up to Da Nang. And from there, back down to Contum, the three of us. So it was, I said, okay. As they say, in those days, I was going to be running with the tall dogs in the big grass right from the beginning as against uh, um, you know, building up experience. I'd never been in combat before, so uh, you learn it can be a sharp learning curve. What impressions did you get of Glenn Uemura when you met him for the first time? Uh, quiet individual. Um, wasn't, you know, didn't do anything to necessarily draw attention to himself. Uh, of the three of us, I was probably the more, like I said, typical New Yorker. Didn't mind opening my mouth with an opinion. 
if I thought you were wrong, I would say it. And managed to keep myself just on the non-cutting edge of the blade rather than having to be brought in to be a reprimanded or receiving Article 15 or something like that. But I was probably the more talkative out of the three of us. How about John Plaster? Was was this his second tour with Sog? No, this was his first tour. His first tour? Yes. Mm. And how did you find him? Like, both of them likable, got along with both of them. Uh, let me see, Plaster went to Team New York. Uh, Yamura went to Hawaii. Uh, he was from Hawaii, and uh, one of the team leaders was from Hawaii. So he says, oh, good, I got a Hawaiian to work with. They needed someone to run the comm center for a while. Uh, and so my initial job in about the first month there was uh, running the comm center, uh, drawing up uh, 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 SOIs uh, for the teams deploying uh, 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 giving them their cheat communications cheat sheets and uh, call signs. I was responsible for doing call signs and so forth. Can you just explain for viewers what an SOI is? Uh, signal operating instruction, which is basically what you follow when you, you're going to communicate and if you have any uh, coding or crypto, then you, know, you follow the instructions in the SOI. So that was my job uh, to, like I said, to assign the frequencies, uh, call signs, and uh, until the Air, Force, the Air Force took over just as I left that to go to the uh, team leader school and be assigned to a team. So during that time, were you able to monitor missions of guys in the field with teams? No, I was at the base station. We had a relay site. We had, matter of fact, at that time we had two relay sites, one in Cambodia and one in Laos. Mm -hmm. And I could uh, hear both of them when they transmitted, but I couldn't hear the teams. Uh, so if something was going on, uh, I would know something was going on, but I couldn't hear the team side of it. Maybe if I was able to switch frequencies on one of my FM radios, I might be able to catch the Covey pilot because he was up high. Um, and But that would be snatches. Uh, but you know, we had direct communications with our relay site, which was on a, about a 3,000 foot granite spire that shot straight up. So it was, it was more than defensible. And um, they would relay uh, that if the launch site had closed down for the day, they would relay back straight back to the base station. Are you describing mission support site Leghorn there? Yes. Yeah. yeah we'll put a picture up of it. Um, Great. So when you were based there, did you have recon teams in hooches at that location or were they based at other locations? No. Uh, 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 when they reorganized, when I arrived, by the time, it was January by the time I got down to Contum, at which time it was FOB2, and flew by being FOB1. And I forget where FOB for country, someplace. Anyway, I uh, it was FOB two, and then they and we were under basically we were C and C FOB two, and uh, and our headquarters was in Da Nang, mm -hmm. and then CCS at that time was C five, and. Um, they weren't, un, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure they weren't under Da Nang. Uh, and, and I think they direct ported, reported in. But uh, at the 
beginning of February, they made each FOB an independent entity. So Da Nang became CCN, Kantun became CCC, and C5 became CCS. And those were the basic operating bases in which the teams would deploy out of to the launch site and then from your launch site to whatever target area you were going into. So what happened when you finished with the comment? I went to the team leader school down in Lantan, and then when I came back, uh, they reconstituted one of the teams, and uh, I was the radio operator for that team, uh, Team Iowa, with uh, Ken Snyder as the team leader, and uh, can't, can't think of the other guy's first name, Rice was the assistant team leader. And uh, I guess they would have taken you to meet the Indige. Yes. And how did that go? Went fine. Uh, I never had a problem of uh, uh, getting along with someone from another country. Uh, matter of fact, I, the more foreigners I met, the better off I thought I was. I was I was big into going native. Um, eating their food, uh, drinking, whatever. The only thing I learned that I didn't do is if they, if the team members cooked food, uh, which they, you know, did from scratch, if, if they could do from scratch, uh, that I, w I was, when, especially when I had my own team, uh, you bring the rice wine, I'll bring the food, because they didn't necessarily cook food properly. Um, so, um, now I didn't mind going to their mess hall, which the food was prepared by regular Vietnamese army cooks. But as far as going to the village or they bringing food from the village to eat, um, I was a little skeptical of doing that mainly for, <coughs> excuse me, for health reasons. I've, I've heard about some teams, um, and it might be just to do with that particular branch of Montagnard uh, tribe. When the new guy turns up, they, they just sort of take your watch and your rings and your cash out of your pockets and pretty much strip you of everything you own as part of their acceptance of you? Have you ever heard about anything like that? Or? Uh, for the time I was there, uh, no, they didn't do that. It was when you, were, when you deployed on a mission, then you went stern. Mm. So you lost your ID tags, any rings, uh, uh, ID card, no military markings uh, on whatever you wore whatever you decide, whether it was jungle fatigues or tiger stripes or whatever. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, just before I got there, uh, they weren't even using American weapons. It was all foreign weapons. But uh, the NVA knew enough about us that it really didn't matter which one. They had captured M-16s. And, and other American weapons, and they still have weapons left over from when the French were there. Uh, but, and supplied primarily by the Chinese, and so forth. And it was there when I started learning that I prefer my people to have all American weapons except for my point man. Um, I just did not like the operation of Chinese, Chinese of weapons. To me, Russian weapons were bad enough. Yeah. Uh, and Chinese weapons were a little bit behind the Russian weapons, in my opinion. Um, and so I, I carried only American weapons, except for my point man, which carried an AK. I think once we carried an 
SKS, uh, but the ammunition and the belt feed for the RPD to me wasn't worth it. That, that, was, that was a pretty nice weapon, uh, the RPD. They're uh, equivalent to our M60 machine gun. Uh, that wasn't bad, uh, but as I recall, that had a cloth belt feed and Sometimes it, get, it had a way of malfunctioning that um, was different from an M60. And plus, if I'm going to carry 6 7.6 why'd I carry an American weapon, uh, which had just as much punch as uh, the 7.62 from an AK. So. I uh, I never bought, I mean, I would practice on it, but uh, just in case the point man got hit and I had to grab his weapon or whatever, uh, I, I used only American weapons myself. Did you ever carry any sort of more esoteric weapons like suppressed pistols and things for prisoner snatches and that kind of thing? Um, once. I carried a high standard, uh, and it was by the time I arrived in country, they had been uh, purloined to the extent that they were issued on on basically seniority or uh, uh, as need base, the same as the high power and the uh, sword knife enough people are going home with them uh, that um, unless you really needed one, uh, you didn't carry it. And my preference over the high standard was the well rod, uh, which uh, a little bit quieter than the high standard. Uh, the high standard was 22 and the well rod was uh, 32. So I felt the 32 had just a little bit more punch than a 22. And which you really had to be up close. What I would love that we had, uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, uh, coming out of World War II, um, they took some of the British, uh, or the Webleys, but it was 303s and they rechambered them for 45 ACP, and the whole barrel was a suppressor. Uh, that, I wouldn't, even though it was, I think it was a bolt action. Uh, I found out later that after World War II, some company down in South Africa uh, uh, was allocated the license to me because the farmers like, like to uh, use them for, uh, anti-thievery and predators for their livestock and so forth down in South Africa. Now, those were very nice. 45, 45 had a good punch to it. And with the whole barrel being a suppressor, it was, it was really quiet. Um, but um, we, re we really didn't have any access to them. Most of the foreign weapons we had were a British or Scandinavian, Israeli uh, uh, manufacturer. So um, Snyder is your one zero. Did he or any anybody else in Recon Company take you aside and help you set up all of your LBE and your and draw down the right equipment that you needed? Because because Sog obviously carried a a lot of very custom and specific equipment in specific places? Um, what do we do? We standardize our emergency radio. You know, each team had their own way of doing things. But with us, we standardize our emergency radio and at least one grenade and what we had in the bottom of our rucksacks. Uh, how you fitted your ammunition around your belt, whether you use canteen pouches or magazine pouches and so forth. 
you were allowed to individualize. The only thing he didn't like of what I did was I, there's, you know, radio operators were a prime target. So what I did was I took a flak jacket and had it gutted out, took it into town, had it reconfigured to fit my radio inside of that. And uh, which he didn't like because he couldn't swap out his rucksack for the way I had my gear set up. And the only other thing I did different was uh, I wore a fanny pack on my web gear in case I had to drop my rucksack and, and to break contact and, and run. So I carried a fanny pack, which had the extras that I needed. And that which still gave me maybe two days of extra food and um, maybe a couple extra magazines of ammunition and maybe one or two grenades. So what was your typical combat load of CAR-15 mags? Uh, about 600 rounds. And then if you wanted more, you carried extra magazines in, in your, in your uh, rucksack and uh, all your pockets, but most of us we would have extra rounds and uh, extra magazines in our rucksacks. So a minimum, when I was with Snyder and then when I had my own team, uh, basic load was uh, 600 rounds and uh, then extras as you could fit just in case you did run up across something much larger than you and you had to run a little bit farther than you expected to get to an LZ to get extracted. And that, how many and what type of grenades would you carry? Um, carried a standard grenade and I generally carried one white phosphorus grenade. Uh, and then they came up with the mini grenades. And when I had my own team, and I myself, I loaded up with mini grenades and also my mountain yards could throw a mini grenade much better than they could a standard grenade. And they definitely, once I watched them try to practice with a white phosphorus, no, I'll take the white phosphorus. You use the mini grenades and, uh, and uh, if you could carry more mini grenades and also you know at the ranges that we were operating at to me a mini grenade was just as effective if you didn't because basically what you're looking at is just to keep people from getting too close to you on your back trail while you're trying to to get away from them so to me and you, you could still put your own take out the factory fuse and put your own fuse in there so you could drop one behind you. It wasn't as noticeable and you could put a delay on it rather than the four seconds. And uh, so what if you thought that somebody was say a minute behind you or whatever, then you, you knew where you had your grenade. You just pull one that had a minute, two minute delay on it, whatever you said on it, and then just drop it in and worry about throwing it and hoping that would go off just about the time they would approach it. And um, um, fortunately, the two times that uh, we made contact, I, that I made contact, I never had to use them that way. So. And did you carry claymores yourself as well? Yes. Uh, but I would say someplace around my fourth or fifth, fifth mission, rather than set out claymores, I'd rather set out grenades, regular grenades, with a claymore detonator because if I could run the wire, uh, in a different direction and with no face to it. It was uh, just lying on the ground. 
And so therefore, they were looking for claymores. I, I would put out a grenade maybe behind a tree. The tree had a low enough branch. I could put it over the branch and uh, then run it back to my position. And also, if it was on the ground, uh, when it was time to, when you came out of your rest overnight, and just pull it in with the claymore, you had to go out and get it, and which meant more movement. So you just pull your grenade in and uh, set the safety on the firing. Yeah, I think it had a safety to it on the claymore firing device. Throw it in your pouch and keep it there until it was time to use it again. I suppose you would have cut the wires to the right length as well, so you don't have to take them too much with you. Um, actually figured out a way to make the wire longer so that the wire didn't come straight back to you. You could run it off, then down, then back over, and then to you. So, so if a person had to follow it, follow a zigzag, you know, that hopefully you would hear them. And then you knew that, you know, someone was trying to, to, uh, run down to where, you know, uh, by the time I got over there, they were starting to use trackers. They had professional trackers and LZ watchers and so forth. Uh, they had really uh, increased their security on the Matter of fact, they had a whole regiment, I think, too, that their job was to provide security for the trail. And they actually had uh, Chinese advisors uh, that worked with them. Um, the, um, so, yeah, if anything, you wanted a way to make your wire longer so you could run it sort of in a zigzag pattern where they can just trace it straight back to your position. So, so the first mission, um, you're mounting up on the helicopter and how, how can you recall to go back to that time and... Just think how, how that felt going out with the team for the first time into into bandit country. Uh, first mission uh, was actually one of our quietest areas uh, to work in. Matter of fact, I think that's where Plaster also captured his first POW. Um, matter of fact, we made it high, hot enough that they actually posted a sign. I think Plaster has it in his, he might have it in his photography photos of Vietnam of where they posted a sign, be careful for Americans here. But it was a perfect ambush site because you came down off a hill like in a little, more of a gully than a depression, and it wasn't a valley. You came up to the road and you crossed the road and you went up an embankment. So it was a good ambush site. And you could actually sit up claymores across the road from you, facing down the road, go out with a law or an RPG to take out the lead truck or set up the claymores for your ambush and so forth. And uh, we went out to... Uh, and part of our mission was to meet up with a uh, hatchet force platoon that was running an operation. And, uh, and then we were supposed to be a stay behind once the hatchet force pulled out. And since that was for all three Americans on the team, that was our first mission. So the hatchet force commander stayed behind with him and his lead point man stayed behind with us for uh, uh, so there would be some experience there. And uh, once the platoon was lifted out, I think it wasn't more than two nights. I think it was one night uh, and they were sending people out to look to see what they could find. And their point man and our point man peeking under the bushes, saw each other at the same time. And um, they decided to pull us out. So, um, 
I forget how long it took for the helicopters to get in, but eventually they got in. And um, Covey tried to provide as much distraction as possible until the helicopters and gunships could get in and get us loaded up and then back to uh, Docto, which was our launch point. So when the two point guys saw each other, I am assume, I'm assuming they opened fire. Yes, they both opened fire. So and that's when I found out what adrenal, real adrenaline could be like because uh, the whole time, every time I had to get up off the ground, I'd have to get on my hands and knees and hold on to a tree or something to stand up. And when that first round went off, I was sitting down with my legs out in front of me and I was on my feet just like that, no turning around, getting on my knees <laughs> and so forth. And I uh, had my machete out to cut down a small tree to get it out of the way for when the helicopter landed. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, so that's when I found out what adrenaline could actually be like. Because probably what we haven't mentioned is you're probably carrying 70 to 100 pounds or something at this point on your LB in your rook. Well, I would say probably someplace between 50 and 70 pounds. I didn't carry that much food. Uh, I, I think that was about the only time I carried sea rations. Maybe one other time, my next one, I carried uh, primarily uh, indige rations, which were lighter. Uh, I didn't have to worry about debris with it and so forth. Uh, it was in cellophane, put a rubber band around it, keep your pocket, it kept the food warm. And when you wanted to eat something, you just take it out and punch out as much from the little cellophane tube as you want it and put it back in your pocket. So two or three of those could last me for a mission. So at that point of when it, when all hell breaks loose, um, you're, you're carrying the radio, so, and someone's got to talk to Covey, would that be you or would that have been uh, one, one zero getting alongside you? I would probably be the initial operator and then one zero could take over and say exactly you know, what, he, what he, he, let him give the full details. I just got to say, hey, lay call my contact, you know, call sign, contact. And uh, this particular day, the covey wasn't that far away. So he was able to call in for uh, air support. We might have been within artillery range, I, I don't recall. Uh, but uh, once the one zero took over communications, then between him and the covey and Lake Horn, saying that you know, either we got casualties, we don't, whatever you know the situation was. So at that point, is he is Snyder using the handset that's connected to your radio? Yes. So you've got to stay close to him yes. the whole time. And just like with any regular radio operator uh, with a regular unit. You're staying right close to whomever is in charge. And I guess at this point your car 15 is up and you're returning fire. As, as needed. So, um, but generally, and I, I try to keep as quiet as possible so because if my position got exposed with the radio and the radio went out, then you didn't have any communications unless you used your emergency radio. Right, so you'd only shoot if a guy was looking right at you, yes. drawing a bead, and you right. let the rest of the team do the fighting. Yes. Smart. And were you told to do that? Were you taught to do that? Or did you just do that out of instinct? Um, a little bit of both. I think when I went to the team leader school, they, they were the ones who brought out about, you know, hey, they're looking for the radio operator. And uh, so we would try to make improvised antennas rather than having that six foot, uh, four foot stick sticking out from you. Uh, and then you're listening too for someone talking like they're talking over a radio. Uh, 
So my job was make the initial contact, uh, hand over the, unless the one zero wanted me to do all the talking per his instructions and keep that radio out of sight as much as possible. The, uh, oh, the significant thing about that, we crossed the pond. It was Easter time, matter of fact. And the whole pond was covered in Easter lilies. Actually, they were water lilies, but I look at the whole pond. You, matter of fact, you could hardly see any patches of water. And it was about chest deep. But I'm saying, here I am in Vietnam on Easter Sunday or Easter whatever, and I'm standing here and an overgrowth of water, uh, of Easter lilies. And uh, last year at SOAR, I um, sitting down talking with uh, Snyder, and I said, you wanna know the, the thing I remember almost most significantly was when we went through that pond of Easter, and he says, I'm glad you, he, he had, for years, he had been trying to convince his mother that he went through a pond of Easter lilies. He says, as soon as I get home, because I can tell her, my radio operator reminded me of that pond of lilies. Uh, and they were beautiful. I mean, they were actually pink, pinkish blue, pinkish red, white, pinkish white. Just the whole, I would say the pond was maybe three to four times the size of this rock. And um, so I, I, I thought that was kind of significant. Thinking of the environment, uh, how, you know, I've heard it said that when you first get off the helicopter, your ears are shot because you, if you've come from altitude, you've got the altitude ear thing going on and then you've had the, the noise of the helicopter too. So you get out and you can't hear very much. You're going to just wait and... Right. Just wait. Wait. To me, it was waiting for the noise of the helicopter to clear. I didn't have, because we weren't flying at that high of an altitude. You didn't want to fly so high that you were susceptible to anti-aircraft fire if there was any in the area, but you didn't want to fly so low that you were susceptible to small arms uh, ground fire. So there was, the pilots always look for that sweet spot. Uh, so it was mostly the noise from the helicopter rather than your ears popping from the altitude. That part I didn't have any problem. It was the noise, waiting, waiting for your ears to clear from the noise and so you could hear what was going on around you. And did you get a sense of the sounds of the jungle changing, knowing, you know, there's more stillness if there's going to be an ambush, that kind of thing, or contact? Um, it was, you, you kind of, you, you always try to keep your senses attuned to the environment around you. The only thing that could really throw you off, at least for my, to my, experience with Gibbons. Uh, Gibbons could, they could almost sound like a person. And one of my colleagues, one crept up on him and tried to pull on his web gear, which caused him to jump up and sh shoot the whole ground around him. And they had to, everybody had to get up and move to a new location. Uh, so in certain areas, you have to watch out for gibbons uh, because they could give away your position, you know, cause you to give away your position, or they themselves might uh, give away your position. Um, matter of fact, from that first mission, uh, we were followed by a rooster and his hens. He had two hens, I believe it was, off the LZ. So 
they follow, they follow us until we're able to get rid of them. And when we did our after action re detailed after action report, uh, we said, you know, maybe they were domesticated just enough that if they put some initial food down around wherever they are, because they didn't necessarily have enough LZ watches to watch all LZs, but they could have LZ checkers. So if there's domesticated animals that are there, and then they figured if the animals are not there, they had to leave for some reason, is try to listen for them to see which way they went to see if they were following other humans to get some food or something chased them away. I mean, they were still snakes. I never saw any, uh, or tigers, which I never saw. Only, the only thing I worried about lying on the ground were small poisonous snakes where, especially during the rainy season, where if they crawl up underneath of you for the warmth, and you move not realizing they're there and startled enough where it now could bite you up around your neck or head reason or hand reason, as long as you were standing. The smaller snakes like um, the, the creek, uh, which for there was like the fertile ants in Central America. Um, the uh, Um, that was the only wildlife that I was leery of. Um, other than that, uh, if I would get dirty enough and smelly enough where I found out field mice would crawl up on my chest and just sit there until they realized all of a sudden this log has got motion to it and it, you hit them you know, Scoot off. So when that happened, I figured I was ripe. Uh, I smelled like the jungle. We were talking about insects earlier and, and uh, preventing malaria. Can we just run over that again? Uh, yes, you know, at that time they had the malaria pills, uh, which you were supposed to take at dinner time or something like that. Uh, most people didn't like them, and what I would do is I'd buy up six packs of tonic water and drink tonic water for the quinine. And I'm pretty sure the, the amount of quinine and, and tonic water did not amount to what was, was in the malaria tablets. There was another malaria tablet, there were two. One had quinine and I forget the name of the medication that was in the main tablet, um, but that was what you were supposed to, to use. And you know, so I just, I would drink lots and lots of quinine, quinine water. And, and did, you, did you struggle with biting insects? Mm, only one time. Um, when I was in the training to go to Southeast Asia, we went to a section of North Carolina called Green Swamp. And it was the first time I ran across a fly called a deer fly. Uh, a little larger than the average, say an oversized fat household fly, but it had a reddish brown fuzz to it. And insecticide was like an appetizer to them. And uh, I mean, for some reason, they, I attracted them, and I mean, they just tore my hands up. And on one of my missions, uh, I ran across deer flies. But you know, by then I learned to carry gloves with me all the time. So I was, either I had my gloves on already, or I just pulled them out and put them on and uh, continued on about my business. But uh, that was, the only insect, and leeches, uh, land leeches, uh, I didn't like, because they could get through your socks, uh, through your fly, whatever, if they got up your leg. Uh, 
I wound up with one in my mouth one time. Um, the uh, so they were they could feel and sense you coming, so you could see them, you know, in your direction, flip flopping, and so forth. Uh, but uh, the mosquitoes, yeah, you know, they they could be a bother, but you you can kind of get used to the mosquitoes. But uh, leeches. Uh, no, I didn't like and deer flies. I didn't like. Um, so I, uh, I mean, you might run across ticks every now and then, but I, you run across leeches more than, at least in my experience, than you did ticks. Can we talk a little about camouflage? Camouflage was up to the individual. Uh, some people wore tiger stripes. The material used for that wasn't as strong as the material used for uh, jungle fatigues. Plus, it's a little bit on the s small side. Some people wore black pajamas. What most people did was they took spray paint and just randomly sprayed their jungle fatigues. Uh, to me, Camouflage, if it really wasn't done correctly, could be as much of a detriment as it could be an asset because not all people see camouflage the same way. Um, and the NVA used mountain yards also, and they were primarily animus and they looked at trees, shrubbery, brush, and so forth from a slightly different perspective than we did. And I said, what quicker way to get yourself shot than someone saying a rock is not supposed, and they shoot the rock and it turns out to be you. So I just let my jungle fatigues get dirty before I would take off and just maybe I might throw one splash of black paint across it or something just so there wasn't just one straight line. But for the most part, I, I didn't use. And before I left, uh, they were just really starting to send camouflage, US made camouflage uniforms in. And I, I didn't like them. Um, as I recall, the material was heavier than the jungle fatigues. Uh, also, my, and the other thing that gave me that was I was never supposed to be a paratrooper. I have a strong red-green reject. I, mean, I made both through jump master school and, and basic airborne coach. So under certain situations, I could see uh, I, I had a strong red-green reject. So therefore, certain green patterns will show up different to me than it would to other people. They might see something, I might not see it, but then I could see things that they might not necessarily see. Um, and it, I, if I remember correctly, red, green, reject is, especially the green reject, is a good way to pick up patterns in woodlands and uh, in the jungle. Did you use a camo stick or anything on your face? Uh, yeah, I would use a little bit. This hit a high spot and so forth. Um, the, uh, I just tried to remain as natural as possible. And like I said, if you don't take a shower for a couple of days before you, you went out on your mission, by the time your second day out there, you, you, know, you stink. Uh, and once the mice and so forth, you when they start crossing your body, you realize you you know you become part of the jungle. So can we go on some missions now? And uh, we, we've done the first mission, and you've got about another six or seven for some. Yeah, I um, most of my missions were quiet. Uh, 
I have, as we were talking about before, I have one mission when the uh, one Special Forces A team that watched the tri-border area uh, uh, was under siege. They put us, um, about four teams of us out uh, to look for infiltration, exfiltration routes, whatever, uh, leading into that camp. And one of the Cobra Loach Hunter Killer teams strayed out of their AO uh, across the line. And they knew they had seen something. Uh, and so they decided they would fire randomly. Um, they weren't paying any attention to the air frequencies. And most of all, they weren't paying attention to the guard frequency. And um, so I won't say whom, but we receive it. Like, well, if they fire on you again, it's self-preservation. And fortunately, the weather went bad. Uh, and they might have been running low on fuel also. So they took off and when they took off, we took off. But within an hour or so, we could hear them come back, still looking to see, see if they could see what they thought they had seen. And I had one, when I was with Snyder, we had one other contact in which we had to go out on strings. And that's when I found out that being extracted on strings uh, under live fire was not the same as when you practice on strings at school. They don't pick you straight up. They drag you through the trees and, and everything. And I had a piece of equipment to go bad. And so for about 40 minutes, I was hanging below this helicopter wondering, was the equipment going to totally fail? And I go down into the jungle or would I hold on long enough to get back to the lot site? Which I got back to the lot site. Um, and then, um, the one time my team made full contact was I had to go out on a ladder. Uh, and that's not fun either uh, because you're supposed to use the cloud to climb up into the aircraft. But one of my end-ditch adrenaline sank on him when he went to go up, to, up the ladder. And I, I couldn't push him up or anything, so I just hung on to the ladder with him, make sure he didn't fall off. And... Uh, until we got back. Um, and instead of going straight into the dock, so we went into that A camp that I said, I've been under siege. Uh, I needed medical attention uh, before I went to the, I didn't realize I was gonna have to go to the hospital. And we stopped off there initially for medical attention. Um, and then my last mission, which I made a mistake, uh, Another Medal of Honor uh, winner, uh, Franklin Miller, uh, had been in the area just before me and advised me when he went in, when he did his uh, aerial reconnaissance looking for an LZ, he had seen oil drums up under the tree line. And it just so happened that uh, the pilot for my aerial reconnaissance, this was his last flight um, John Plaster mentioned them, uh, the Sneaky Pete Air Force, which were actual Army pilots assigned, assigned directly uh, to us flying O-1s. And uh, as the large, this is our Nozomos area, and the large area we called the golf course, because that's kind of looked like a golf course without any greens or sand traps. And um, it was a little pop time hooch. And I said to the pilot, 
You ever, ever see anyone running, you know, from them or something? He says, no, they hear us long enough before uh, we get up over top of it and they just stay still. Well, I guess this one guy was brave because he shot up through it and hit our aircraft. It was, well, he, I mean, he got very upset with me because he had been on his whole 12 months, never took a round in his aircraft. And here he is, his last flight, and he takes several hits to his aircraft. And one cut about 50% of the strand, one of the rounds cut about 50% of the strands for, um, but it was elevator uh, control. And um, he told me to stay away from him uh, when we got back on the ground. But where I made a mistake, um, I didn't detail my map study sufficiently. And there was an actual bivouac area uh, in that particular AL. Uh, and I had a brand, brand new, Amer both Americans were brand new that I had on the team with me. And the, my radio operator, um, it rained the whole time we were, the first couple of days we were there. So I came down off the mountainside and as we came down, there was an actual pig walla there. And the water coming out of the ground was running off the mountains. And oh, some of the purest water I ever drank, or at least pure tasting. So, um, I took out my canteen cup and lit up some C4 to boil the water and stir in a couple of bouillon cubes to pass around to everyone uh, so they could get some heat energy inside of them. And my radio operators said, oh, we got a point company for, a uh, point element for a company coming toward us. And I didn't double check it. I just, let's get out of here. And that the water from that pig wallow ran across a little creek. And as we crossed that creek, there was freshly cleaved wood for a classroom there. And I said, this doesn't look good. And I went up to go up the ridge. And as soon as I got to the ridge line, there was nothing I could see but foxholes. And I said, Pope, uh, you really did it this time. <laughs> and I'm telling my radio operator, because we were, at, we were at the limits to having consistent contact with Leghorn. Because instead of launching out of Doc Toe, we um, launched out of Doc Peck, which was our furthest most A-team for uh, two core. Mm -hmm. And that was, from there was about a 40 minute flight by helicopter to, uh, Matter of fact, as I remember correctly, even the King Bees didn't, didn't go along, it was just the Hueys. And I'm saying, now I'm bringing my emergency radio out because I don't know what this company is going, you know, whether they heard us or whatever. He's not getting lay corn on his radio. So, hey, let me see if my ERP-10 is going to bring in a covey. And uh, we got a cubby, and he stayed with us on the overflight uh, for about half the night. And I spread us out on open ground among some loose trees and so forth. And it was a bright moonlit night too, so we could see all around us. And everything went quiet. That was the last mission I ran. And from there, I went to Hawaii and became married. And uh, that's fantastic, thank you. And, and so, um, could you just uh, go over, after you left Vietnam, um, just in brief, I suppose, uh, what, what, what the rest of your Army uh, career entailed? Um, left Vietnam, went to the 10th group up at Fort Devens, and it was time for a reforger. Well, the 10th group at that time, if nobody knew you, 
uh, they're not going to directly put you to, so they say, okay, we already got everyone assigned for Reforge, well, for, for us it was Flintlock portion of Reforger. So my wife was happy to hear that. And uh, but it turned out my company commander was my deputy commander at the FOB in Vietnam. And as I turned the corner to go into the oily room, who's going into the oily room at the same time was the company commander. And he saw the motion, looked up, did a double take and said, uh, what are you doing here? I said, I've got this sheepish gun. I said, I work for you now, sir. He said, your rucksack packed? I said, uh, no, they told me that. Uh, and he immediately went to the company clerk and said, hey, this is one of my team leaders. You get him on the manifest. He's going on Flintlock. I don't care what team we have to put him on, but he's going on Flintlock. And uh, that's when I joined uh, one of my team members uh, who live, or lives in Bowie. He grew up in the D.C. area. And I was sitting in a restaurant that some of us frequent quite a bit. Actually, we patronized the place. And I had been to a Redskins game, you know, Commanders. And uh, so I wore, that's when they came up with the uh, Patriot colors. And I put my MacV sock patch on. And I was sitting at the bar waiting for some more people to show up. And uh, there's a set of twins. And one twin I worked with quite a bit on, on teams, that's fill-ins. And uh, it was either he or his brother came in and they saw this guy, you know, sitting at the bar with this patch on that, you know, hey, this, this has got to be, you know, a wannabe or a stolen valor. And he came up and started questioning. I turned around and looked at him, you know, like, yeah, who the heck are you? <laughs> And I said, I was in group. He said, I was too. I got to talk. He said, he said uh, where were you? I said, I was at Fort Devens. He says, I was at Fort Devens also. He said, my brother's sitting over in the corner. You not took a second. When I first met them, they were so young and fresh, they weren't even shaving yet. I mean, literally, they were not shaving. Now they put on about a hundred pounds, and and when he said that, I said, "Ah, you're the twins." And uh, unfortunately, one of them passed away from a heart attack, but the brother, the remaining brother, and I still meet up and get together, have a couple of drinks, and so forth. Um, but uh, yeah, I got to Fort Devens, and. There was no SOCOM at that time. Um, and I'm looking around and I said, you know, wasn't planning on getting out. Uh, what can I do outside of being a policeman or applying to be a contractor and being a bundle kicker out of some low-flying aircraft, hoping I'm not getting shot at. And one of my teammates had gone over and talked with the people in counterintelligence and they were looking for people with, uh, with experience at that time. He says, go down and talk with them. And they said, yeah, uh, you, you know, you're the type we're looking for. And uh, so I went down, did the paperwork. My commander signed off on it. And the next thing I know, I was in the intelligence school and did that for the rest of my career. Any uh, final sort of reflections on uh, the Vietnam War, coming home, that kind of thing? Did you experience any problems? No. I, the few times I wore a uniform, uh, I never had a problem with anyone, and it could have been because of the beret or whatever. I don't know, but I never had a problem. Um, the uh, the uh, and like I said, in special forces, most people coming back, no matter what group they went to, 
at least 25% of the people or more were Vietnam veterans. At least half of those had multiple tours. Uh, I had a tour and a half. Uh, some people had three tours. I think uh, I didn't see Billy Wall here in the States, but when I was there, he was on his fourth tour. And his thing was, he never completed the tour because he always wound up being shot and medevac. Uh, so uh, I never had a problem. Um, I, uh, I just, my wife, my my colleagues there in the tenth group, you know, would say, no, hey, Miss Pope, you know, a ask your husband, you know, what he did, you know, why his hair grew faster and all of that, um, why his testosterone and adrenaline went up so much and so forth. And she, then we would get home and she would say, why well, do they keep saying that to me? That's a typical New Yorker, you know, that, um, you know, so forth. Uh, so she, before she died, she never uh, found out exactly. All she knew I was in Vietnam. My son actually is the only family member. Uh, he saw the patch. He became military himself, although he got out. He started doing his research. And uh, so um, knew that I had been with uh, a special unit over in, in Vietnam and that uh, we weren't, you know, it was not an acknowledged operation. So that didn't come about until mid to late 90s when just before we got our presidential unit citation. Uh, I think hints of it almost made it into the Pentagon Papers that were published by the Washington Post and uh, New York Times. Uh, I kept looking through to see if anything, um, never saw anything. And by then I was on my way to Germany uh, for uh, CI assignment. So no, I, as far as non-acceptance or someone saying anything to me when I returned from Vietnam, no, I, actually I ran across more flack uh, when I retired and went into uh, the aerospace industries and be marked. Yeah. Found out that I had been special forces and oh no, no, we got a snake eater with us and they expect people to be doing. And some of the things they were criticizing me about, it turned out that, uh, you know, following 9-11, yeah. that's what they had to plan for. Uh, mm -hmm. In certain parts of the industry and in the, uh, I spent most of my time with the Department of Energy and that's what we had to plan for. Um, terrorists uh, going after facility. And you know, I says, well, you know, this is what I've been saying all along, and people didn't want to accept it. Well, Pope, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us today, and uh, uh, you know, welcome home. And uh, uh, you know, you're you're a member of the Brotherhood in SOG, and I look forward to seeing you again at SOAR. I definitely will be there. Mm. And buy you a beer there. Well, thank you. I. Uh, you probably got more out of me than you would have 20 years ago or whatever. I mean, as I said, my son is the one that kind of opened me up. He because he was a dad, you know, hey, look, you know, you just, you know, saying, you know, people ask you, what did you do during the war? Eh, I was a grunt, <laughs> you know. <laughs>